All right, hello. Um, my name is Shelby Ellison. I work at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Horticulture. I have my PhD in plant genetics and focus on vegetable genetics and breeding. So, um, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Leah Sandler will be talking in the second portion of this, and we also have a real life CBD farmer that will be answering <laughs> all of your questions later on in the session. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a brief outline. Um, so I'll be giving an introduction kind of to the basic plant anatomy of cannabis as well as what CBD is, and then later Leah will be talking about the planting and mid-season considerations for growing this plant, and we'll touch briefly on flowering, and then in our next webinar series we'll focus more on the harvesting and processing of the plant. All right, so <laughs> what is this plant? Well, um, industrial hemp and marijuana, all of these plants are all cannabis sativa. So cannabis sativa is an annual plant, so you plant seed and you get seed in the same year. Um, it was mentioned earlier, I'm going to present this as if you were just tuning in now, so what was said before you might not have heard. So it is a dioecious plant, which means that there are male plants and female plants, very similar to humans, there are males and females. So um, there are some that might have both sexual organs, but for the most part, we'll treat them as dioecious. It is a wind-pollinated plant, and later we'll touch on how prolific the pollen can actually travel. Um, so right now, the working definition is cannabis that has greater than 0.3% THC by dry weight falls into this medicinal or recreational use where it has a high amount of the psychoactive compound THC. Whereas industrial hemp falls in this less than 0.3% THC by dry weight. So we just heard about the seed and fiber production and the rest of our presentation will focus on CBD or cannabidiol. So what is this magical compound? Um, so cannabis produces, it has over 60 different um, cannabinoids, but the eight major cannabinoids are listed here on the right side of the slide. There won't be a test, you don't need to memorize these, but <laughs> what I want you to know is that the, the compounds that are naturally produced by the cannabis, cannabis plant are these cannabinoid acids, and it's only through the treatment or curing of the plant via heat, typically, do you get the compounds THC and CBD that are what we as humans uh, process. So, THCA and CBDA are the most abundant cannabinoids in the cannabis uh, varieties that we're talking about today. So how does CBD work, or how do humans interact with CBD? So uh, all humans have an endocannabinoid system, and almost every single organ in our body has cannabinoid receptors, and these are particularly prevalent in the central nervous system and in the brain. And the endocannabinoid system uh, has four primary purposes. So it's involved in neuroprotection, stress relief, the immune response, and regulating your body's kind of homostate, homeostasis or general state of balance. So uh, the human body has two primary <laughs> cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. Um, so THC binds to these uh, to the CB1 receptor particularly, and that's what causes the psychoactive effect when you have high amounts of THC. However, CB does not bind to this. It actually, um, it does interact, but it causes, um, it, it actually inhibits the breakdown of the body's naturally occurring endocannabinoids, which can lead to an increase of uh, your body producing these uh, beneficial cannabinoids. So this leads to um, a lot of preliminary um, medicinal uses of the CBD product. Now, what I want to mention is, so it wasn't until the 2018 Farm Bill where CBD became no longer a Schedule I uh, drug by, from the DEA. So we can now legally start to do studies federally on this um, group of cannabinoids, which is great because there's a lot of things that are out there on the internet and hearsay, but we don't really have the scientific studies yet to back up how true they really are. So now we can really start to focus on these 
um, medicinal uh, effects as well as the breeding and genetics of it all. But some of the preliminary medicinal uses that are involved are there's anti-seizure, anti-inflammation, pain relief, some anti-tumor effects, anti-psychotic anti effects, as well as decreased inflammation, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and depression. But we need to do a lot of research to find out just how true all of these medicinal uh, claims are. And we'll be talking about some of the research we're doing later on. So where does this lovely little thing come from? So this is, I think, um, one of the most common misconceptions of where CBD is found in the plant. It is not in that little uh, palmate leaf that you think when you think of marijuana <laughs> that is stored highly in the leaf. So the highest concentration of CBDA, the acidic form, is found in trichomes on unpollinated female flowers. So we said it's a dioecious plant. There's males, there's females. So when the females start flowering, um, there are these little hairs that come out. You can see on the left picture there, those little pistils. Um, those are, um, so all around there, there are these trichomes, which have our glandular um, hairs found on the surface of the plant. And those glandular hairs produce both CBD, all of the cannabinoids, as well as terpenes and flavonoids, which all contribute to the plant's aroma and flavor profile. So that's why it becomes very important to understand what plants are females and what plants are males when you're going for CBD production, because you really only want to focus on the females. And if you have males, then you could potentially pollinate your females, which will drastically decrease your amount of CBD extraction later on. So a little lesson on determining the sex of your plants. So um, fortunately, cannabis have these things called pre-flowers, and these pre-flowers can be found at the node of the plant. So if you look where the stalk is and where the branches extend from the stalk, in that little node, you can identify male and female pre-flowers. The big thing to recognize is in the female pre-flowers, there's a little, <laughs> hi, um, a little tiny, um, there's pistils protruding, so they look like little white hairs. And typically by the sixth week after planting, you should be able to identify those female pre-flowers. Um, and you want to get rid of your males, anything that is not showing a female. So it could be a male or it could be a mixture of male and female pre-flowers, which is known as hermaphroditic. You want to throw those in the garbage or start a breeding experiment, but you're not gonna get a lot of <laughs> CBD if you allow those in your field later on. So I have just some pictures of what that looks like in real life. So on the left there, you can see the female pre-flower with the two little pistils exposed. And on the left, you can see a male pre-flower. And then a picture of mature female and male flowers. So you can see lots of those little pistils in the female, as well as the trichomes where you're getting all of that CBD. And then the male flowers, um, you can see kind of the anthers extruding there. The anthers sometimes are nicknamed bananas because they kind of look like little bunches of bananas. So if you see bananas, get rid of the bananas. All right, so um, now, you know, a little bit, you had your basic anatomy lesson and you can tell the difference between your males and females. So now we're gonna talk about what will do well in Wisconsin. Well, this is only the second year, and as you see, probably not a lot of people grew um, for CBD last year in Wisconsin. And we're getting most of our cultivars this year in seed from places like Colorado, Oregon, and California, where they've been growing uh, for a longer period of time. And these are slightly different climates than Wisconsin. It's a lot drier. So it's going to be an exploratory year to figure out what does well in Wisconsin. Um, you may see ditchweed or feral hemp growing kind of all over the state left over from the 40s and 50s. So that is industrial hemp. More than likely, it's not going to have a very high concentration of CBD because it was grown for fiber, typically. You're welcome to try it out, but um, I will be very surprised if a lot of those feral hemp materials have high levels of CBD. So you'll probably want to source your materials from um, some of those other states. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, so what are the planting materials? So there's going to be seed or there's going to be clones that you're going to transplant. 
So seed typically is a little bit more hardy than transplanting clones, and that's just because it's able to grow that taproot and be a little bit more um, structurally sound in the soil. However, seed comes with a downfall of a lot of times when you're buying seed, you're going to get non-feminized seed, which means you're going to have a 50-50 mix of those of males and females. So you're going to need to scout for your males and get rid of 50% of your plants. Some of you know CBD seed is quite expensive, so if you have to throw away 50% of your seeds, that's a little rough. <laughs> um, you can grow with what, or start growing with what's called feminized seeds, where all of your seeds are guaranteed to be females. However, that's typically a higher expense. Um, and a lot of people actually start seeds in a greenhouse first and transplant. Uh, however, this requires hardening off, which Leah will talk a little bit later on. And then the other thing that you can purchase are clones, which are direct cuts from a mother plant. So you'll have a female mother plant that you like a lot and has high CBD and seems to be very hardy. You can take direct cuttings from that that then need to be rooted. Um, the benefit of this is that it's guaranteed to be females, uh, hopefully, unless someone sold you some male clones. Uh, these, again, will then need to be hardened off as they're transplanted into an outdoor growing environment. So uh, earlier, DACAP mentioned that they have a list of approved varieties for CBD production. So you can go to the website to see that list. And again, if you see or if you have a variety that's not listed, you just need to contact them to tell them what you're growing. Um, so typically, you can see a variety name if it interests you. Maybe you think it sounds like a funny name or <laughs> something, then you can just search the internet and try to find sources for clones or seeds. Um, and with that, I'm going to now hand it over to Leah to talk about in-field considerations. All right, great, thank you, Shelby. All right, so now we are gonna talk a little bit about, um, from now on going, we're gonna talk about the agronomics of CBD production. Um, and we're again, kind of as Shelby mentioned and Brian mentioned, we're gonna focus mostly on planting, transplanting, a little bit of in season because it's going to be a series and we will focus on later in the season harvest processing uh, in a later webinar. Uh, this, I'm sorry, did not, I went the wrong way. Down, down, oh, one more. Okay, so, uh, as Shelby mentioned, you can have seedlings or transplants. So seedlings, you're going to start from seed. And so um, there, this all of the information you're going to hear from now out, you're, you know, is adaptable to whatever your growing operation is. Uh, but these are kind of the general general trends. So um, for for starting seeds in transplant cells or in plugs, uh, traditionally you can do 144s. There's also 128s. Um, but the idea being that the smaller is better. Um, that is because when you then go out to transplant these plants, you don't want a plant that has been maturing and is really big, and then you take it out of its little environment enclosed in a greenhouse and you put it in the ground. You're going to have a pretty, that transplant track is going to take you a while to overgrow or outgrow, excuse me. And so the idea being that smaller is better. However, you do want to be conscious of that taproot and not. Uh, preventing it from getting enough growth and wrapping around in a cell because if that also happens then it's going to be difficult when you transplant for the for the plant to to um, thrive in an outdoor situation because the, the roots will be trapped uh, or will have been bound um, potting mixes um, you know that's if a lot of a lot of vegetable growers or, or those that are starting other transplants have their kind of mix that they have they like or that they mix themselves and I'd say go for it um, at least from my knowledge, Taurus might have more on um, if folks have questions on it, um, but, a, but, a, but a pretty general potting mix should do the trick. Um, they will want, the seedlings will want adequate water, um, and unlike in a, in a grain or fiber situation where you are direct seeding into the field, you actually get to control that. Um, again, you are going to want to avoid overwatering. Um, hemp is, hemp seeds, regardless of what, what you're producing them for, if it's CBD, grain, or fiber, it's susceptible to wet soil. And it likes, so it likes water, like anything that could germinate, but not too much. Um, so you can use that, um, you can, can use flood tables or, or a hose or whatever, again, your operation looks like, um, but just to be careful of that. 
Um, and again, planting depth is a little bit less, you know, important if you're using um, transplant transplant trays with 144 cells. But uh, 0.5 inches would be the would be the uh, deepest to put it in there. Um, just try and get them up, especially uh, if you're putting a lot of water on them, because you're unaware of how much you're putting on. So um, that's I'm sorry. That's the wrong way. So for in a greenhouse, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, smaller is better. So you don't want to have those plants in a greenhouse longer than four weeks. So um, basically, once you've gone over a month, those plants are really starting to mature. And when you transplant them out into the field, you're going to have a difficult time with transplant truck, um, as well as they're, if they're moving into any kind of depending on when you're planting them, day length, moving into flowering. Um, you want to try and have them out there in the field before they're flowering. Uh, um, cuttings, um, from what, uh, this is not seeds, but looking at clones or cuttings. Um, if you're cut, just taking a cutting off of a mother plant, it's going to take approximately eight to ten days to start put it, putting out a root from that cutting. And then from there, you can add on those weeks. Um, uh, just, just this is an FYI, um, but for whether it's seedlings started from seed or seedlings started from clones or cuttings, you need to harden them off uh, before you transplant. Um, that's um, similar to, to many other transplants. If, um, if you're a vegetable farmer or doing anything like that, um, tobacco, you're gonna wanna, you, know, you can't take, it's like birthing a baby, you know? <laughs> it's in this nice protected little climate, has all the optimal, you know, optimal light and temperature and to just throw it out in the field. It's, if you do that, you will run into some issues. So, you know, things like a shade cloth, um, on this photo you can see there's a couple different options. You know, there's some pretty high tech ones where you really have almost a greenhouse that's got the shade cloth in it, um, for, or, or just having them out in your garden, putting it out over some, some uh, that looks like a, a uh, horse there um, for uh, just for cutting wood. Um, so whatever, if you if you already do transplants, whatever it is that you do normally to harden them off should work. So now, so that's kind of the in inside starting. I just want a little a little uh, disclaimer. Um, so what we're moving into now is um, we're trying to look at the optimal agronomic protocols for CBD. Um, in, in a field level scale, um, but there's really not a lot of information out there. So a lot of it might be um, from other cannabis production, but again, if we're looking at high quality marijuana production, that's probably all being done in a greenhouse, um, not in a field level scale. Um, and because of the legality of growing the CBD hemp, there hasn't been a lot done in this country. Um, so basically I put this here, take it with a grain of salt, but we've, you know, taking as much there's been, in the last couple of years, there's been some research done um, and just trying to really collect all that. I myself have done um, a little bit of, um, I've grown mostly for grain and fiber, but grew grain varieties as if I was going to harvest for CBD, although I did not. Forest, on the other hand, has grown for CBD and will be able to answer more of these questions coming forward. So, um, first thing is uh, planting and the time of year. So again, um, there's two ways you can transplant, whether that's clones or seedlings that have been started in a greenhouse, or you can direct seed. Um, traditionally, this is mostly going to be done via transplanting. Again, um, want to spend no longer than four weeks in the greenhouse. Um, in Vermont, they started transplanting, excuse me, they started the, the, their, their uh, seedlings 14th of May, and then they didn't transplant those until July 16th, which again is going to be, you can see is longer than four weeks in a greenhouse, but so any, but the important information is they're not putting those plants into the field until July, although they then did other research that was transplanting throughout the month, month throughout the month of June. Um, in New York, uh, there's some research that they were, they were transplanting again early July and 6th of 9th. Um, those both are going to be slightly farther northern latitudes than Wisconsin, so that is something to take into account in terms of the day length and day length impacting flowering. Um, what we have kind of seen in, in Wisconsin is that um, optimal transplanting windows are going to be from a late, J, late May through early June, maybe even mid-June. Um, again, that's going to be weather dependent, um, but th that's kind of the optimal window. Um, hemp is 
as we all have discussed, but even if you're just checking it now, it's day, it's day length sensitive. Um, and so it, it will start to flower as the days start to shorten. And so you want to make sure it's out in that field uh, long enough to get good vegetative growth to support support flowering structures and to support good flowers. Um, again, I mentioned direct seeding. Um, one can also do, and that would not be with seedlings clones. Um, and that can be done a little bit earlier, obviously, because those plants need to get to the need to get to the point of um, where the transplant would be. So that would be kind of a mid-May to early June. Uh, this is a this is a chart. This is from Vermont, and so it's just kind of showing their different uh, transplant days. That I said they did through the month of June. So they had the 14th, the 21st, and the 27th of June. Um, and it's looking at their plant weight at pounds per plant. And so that the the earliest date, um, what had had significantly more weight per plant. Um, and so basically. So they were taking from that that you know getting in getting those transplants into the ground earlier uh, was was more beneficial, and then um, expanding that out just in not looking at only plant weight but also looking at actually flower yield. Um, uh, this and this will be in a PDF form, so you don't have to again, as Shelby said, you don't need to be writing this down or taking notes. Um, but what's kind of interesting is that actually when you then look at the flower yield, um, well, although there is a little bit of difference in that that 21st of June um, had the most dry matter flower yield at pounds per acre, it wasn't significantly different. So this is kind of getting into research talk, which is what is significant, you know, what do we call significant? Um, and so if you're just looking at pure numbers, okay, that's a higher yield. Was it significantly better than the other two? Maybe not, but that's kind of up to the individual producer to decide what they consider significant. Uh, planting into what types of soil? So this is going to be, now we're all, this is again the field, so we're not talking about potting mixture. Um, so as Brian mentioned, one of the, one of the big points is non-marginal land. We don't, especially for CBD production, which is a high profit crop, um, this idea that hemp grows anywhere and grows anywhere well is, uh, in my experience, misguided. Um, and so wanting to be using fields that are, that are good, high, high yield, high production agricultural land. Um, again, well draining soil, uh, similar to what Brian said, um, hemp doesn't like uh, wet soil um, that holds a lot of moisture. So you have an advantage by transplanting later in the season when, when it should be as high rain content, high rainfall um, chances. Um, but again, just to be thinking about that overall. So loamy uh, like soils, again, this is gonna be lo loam soils are high yielding soils generally. Um, so, but, but hemp can have a deep tap root and, tap root, and that will help stabilize uh, the plant, especially if you're going to CBD where you're gonna have these quite heavy plants. Um, and so clay or um, compaction makes it hard on roots to really get down and, and, and anchor, that, anchor that plant as well as um, we want, um, soils that are able to provide a lot of nutrients. Uh, hemp is a pretty heavy nutrient feeder. And so soils that hold nutrients, but um, you want, so loamy soils hold the nutrients but don't bind them the way a clay would. Uh, pH, similar to what Brian mentioned, um, there's, there's a lot of different numbers out there, but somewhere between 5.9 to 6.5, but I've seen up to 7.5. Uh, so this is going to be field prep. So the first thing would be tillage. So how, what is the field prep that you need for CPD production? Um, there's a variety. So again, um, this might be what best fits into your existing operation. So the first is there's no-till potential. So, and um, this is done in a variety of ways. So you can, there's um, similar to maybe the way uh, a vegetable farmer would transplant tomatoes into clover strips. Um, clover being being beneficial because it's a legume and would would um, provide some nitrogen, or um, a rye a rye cover crop that's then been uh, crimped, or other green mat uh, potential. Um, but basically, something that's going to cover the soil in between CBD plants um, because um, of the spacing, which we will talk about later. You can also 
till your soil um, and then potentially plant a cover at the same time that you're transplanting uh, that hemp or, or, or plant a cover and then go and put in your transplants. Um, importantly, before that, talking about weed management, as Brian also talked about, I would recommend tilling more than once. So till it once, let that weed flesh come up, um, and then hit it again before you're transplanting or seeding your crop or seeding the, the cover crop in between plants. Um, another option is black plastic. Um, and this is that's going to act the same way that um, a green manure mat or a, or a cover crop would. Um, don't recommend using straw, and that's due to the fact that um, there's, we're, at, we're growing in a much higher moisture um, environment. And uh, as Ryan was talking about, as I will talk about, hemp is pretty susceptible to mold, and straw is really going to hold that moisture and prevent some pretty big mold problems potentially. So uh, just as a, a picture here, um, this is you have a CBD hemp plants. Hopefully, it's obvious <laughs> which ones are the CBD, and then uh, which is the hemp. Excuse me. And then um, you've got this. Looks like I'm not sure what kind of grass this is, but this is something they put in and they're mowing around their plants. And so once that's established, you're just mowing that as need be, and you don't have to worry about weed competition. Um, fertility, and I will talk. Uh, Speaking of having something else growing in the field, I'm going to mention that here. Um, so again, it's a high nutrient use crop. Um, and so there's a lot of numbers out here on fertility. Um, and it, it's interesting. So, um, but again, the idea that it just put it out there, you don't need to apply any um, fertilizer is really, again, we, the research, the limited research that there is, particularly on grain and fiber, shows that the more nitrogen you give it, the bigger your yields are going to get. So between 100 and 120 pounds N at planting, um, but then you're gonna go, but um, what's been seen in CBD is that putting in CBD production, going in mid-season before flowering and adding some more additional N is really, um, really boosts that yield on the flower and the CBD in the flowers. So um, it looks, what some of the growers have been doing is that approximately 50 pounds on an acre um, about a month after that, that transplant date um, before flowering. And that's because um, the nitrogen, the, the plant is most nitrogen hungry at flowering. And so you're giving it that added N um, right as it's kind of hitting that point. Um, as I mentioned, clover would potentially um, sequester, excuse me, not sequester, um, would provide a little bit of additional N. Um, Although, if you're not taking soil samples at the time, you're not going to know how much, but it should be doing a little bit of that as a legume. Um, it's important to thinking about spacing. So when we're producing uh, industrial hemp or CBD, um, there's a lot of land that's going to be not used. Um, and so if you're, if you're just broadcasting fertilizer, you're potentially fertilizing a lot of soil that isn't going to be used. Um, and obviously, those roots are, will grow and try and access that. Um, but are there ways to kind of really target how you're fertilizing, where those transplants are going, so that you're being able to fertilize in a more effective and cost-effective manner? Um, so one of those, so there's a couple ways. One is if you're laying black plastic, you can be you can be laying in with that black plastic um, if, when you're when you're laying beds. Um, the cover crop. Um, should at least hold the nutrients there. So maybe they're not available for the hemp plants in season, but at least you don't have a lot of soil that's just going, that's going to be open and um, leaching those nutrients, particularly the nitrogen. Um, and then I, in, in the West, um, there are hydro facilities that may be uh, using drip tape, et cetera, um, which I'll talk about later for irrigation, and they actually might be using fertigation. So they're, direct, they're having fertilizer directly to those plants. Uh, so those are just some some thoughts. Spacing. So uh, there's again different recommendations. Uh, that's maybe the theme for this. Is who knows? So um, <laughs> so um, for direct seeding, uh, it's going to look a lot different than transplanting. So uh, the um, again, more of CBD hemp production is going to be transplanting. Um, a woman that I know that direct seeds in Colorado, she does it on 30 inch centers. Mm -hmm. So using you can use um, a corn planter for this. Um, and with in row, she's about 12 to 16 inches. So, and the seed that she was using was 24,000 seeds per pound. And so she was using about half a pound per acre. And this was non-feminized seed, so it was 50-50. So the reason that she had such a close planting with in row was she was then going out and pulling males. And so that, that space is actually going to open up a little bit more. 
within Rome. So, as I say, pulling male students can in increase that spacing. Um, for transplants, there's a lot of different numbers. So that goes from one by one feet all the way up to six by six feet. And so you're looking at, depending on what your spacing is, from about 1,500 to 4,000 plants an acre. So significantly less um, than uh, a direct seed or um, less than obviously grain and fiber production. But it's important to remember that for transplants, even if you use feminized seeds to start seedlings or clones, uh, you may be pulling males, um, and it, that uh, that's a just needs to be thought about um, in terms of. So you might have a slightly different spacing depending on as you pull males. Um, this is a picture of Colorado um, to kind of show that what some spacing look like. You can see they've actually alternated on the side of that plastic bedding, um, and within or in between row, it looks like at least three to four. Uh, so this is again just out of Vermont a quick table to kind of give you those numbers you can do it one by one um, Which is actually quite a few plants per acre. Um, that's going to be more similar to the direct seeding even actually higher than direct seeding um, Which was on 30 inch centers, but then once you get to five by five feet You're looking at about 1700 plants and that might be a bit more typical of what you would see for CBD hemp production So uh, research in Vermont was wanted to see how it does spacing affect yield. Um, and so on the left hand side, you can see the spacing. It's one by one, three to three, and five by five feet. Um, and so if that, the, well, I guess the fourth column that had data, the third of data, the fourth column total, looks at dry matter, flower yield, and pounds per acre. And so what they found was that um, the smallest planting or the closest planting one by one foot had the highest yield, which would make sense. There's more plants in the field, um, but it also had the highest unmarketable dry matter flower yield. Um, and that was due um, to the fact that there was, um, let me just make sure I'm getting this right. Excuse me, it had the least amount of unmarketable dry matter yield. And that was due because the larger plants, those that the higher spacing, the five by five, they had um, more branching uh, because they had more space. And so actually a lot of those branching, given there was heavy rainfall in Vermont, is, um, this was in Vermont, but we saw the same thing in Wisconsin, the heavy rainfall actually caused a lot of soil splashing. And so a lot of those branches that were close to the soil surface got contaminated, thus increasing the amount of unmarketable dry matter flowers. So um, how do you, so now, okay, we talked about how you would prep your, you would till, what tillage you're gonna use, um, in, you know, in what soils, what fertility, um, how are you going to actually transplant or direct seed? So direct seeding, um, as talked about, you would be using potentially a planter, you can use a corn planter, um, and um, the sorghum plate, um, hemp seed is similar to sorghum size, and so growers often use a sorghum plate to uh, direct seed hemp seed, so that's, Primarily, how that's done um, for transplants. There's a there's um, a, a couple different ways. So this could be in, this would be into however you've prepped your land, whether it's no-till and you just mowed everything out, or mat, or, or roller crimps, um, prep beds, pla um, plastic beds. So you can use um, really whatever transplant uh, equipment you have that's already on site. Um, a water wheel. Um, and depending on your spacing, you can just um, some water wheels you can actually take off some of the um, plugs yeah. that push down, and so you can just, mm -hmm. you can put in however many you need, or um, mark them somehow so you see, that, so you know not to put in a plant. Um, also, closing wheel transplanters um, that then, so you're just actually sitting on top and putting those plants and they go shoot down. Um, tobacco setters, so there are, I, I am somewhat new to the state, <laughs> And, but I know that there are um, a large number of farmers that all had small tobacco plots. Uh, so if you have equipment for that, um, that works as well. Again, it's just a, a type of transplanter um, and that will work. Um, and uh, there's a picture that, this, uh, that I have here. Um, and this is on a pretty big scale, um, but you can see those closing wheels and they're just dropping the planters in, or excuse me, dropping the plugs in. Um, but that's kind of what it's not. It's not different than uh, transplanting of other of other crops. 
managing the mail. So we, this has kind of been uh, talked about previously by, by um, Shelby as well as myself. But again, so if you're using non-feminized seed, you're going to have males. If you're using feminized seed, you still might have males. Um, and so you're, uh, you need to, to be on the lookout for them. So scouting is really important. Um, both in your own plants and in potentially nearby feral hemp. So if there's, if you see a lot of ditch weed, if there's way, if you're, you can go out and mow that down um, early so that you don't have to worry about uh, that, those plants potentially pollinating your crop, that's important. Um, but yeah, just trying to get rid of them as soon as possible because males produce a lot of pollen. Um, and so there's talk of, you know, well, what is that, what is that space that you need? So it can sit, be up to 10 miles. Um, but this is kind of a, a quick chart. This was done in um, Kentucky that was looking at um, basically the amount of pollen over, over a distance. So um, from the center of the field, um, how far is that pollen traveling? And so you can see that um, within one mile, you've reduced it to 50%, but that's still 50% of the pollen a mile away from the center of that field. Um, and it reduces as you go out, but as, as, you, as you get farther away from, from the epicenter, um, but um, 10 miles away, there's still potentially 20%. Excuse me, meters, I appreciate that. Ooh, uh, that's, yeah, but not miles, meters. Um, there's 20% of the ball, and that, that would be 400 miles away. So, thank you. Um, and so, and the reason that that is important is because one, if you do, have, as Shelly mentioned, your flowers are pollinated, the percentage of CBD reduces drastically. So you don't really have to look at the different uh, bars, They're just talking about where on the plants the flowers were. But you can see on the left-hand side, um, the flowers that were pollinated have significantly lower percentage of CBD than those that were not pollinated on the right-hand side. Um, I want to just quickly mention indoor production. So we're focusing mostly on field production um, in this talk. That's primarily because we imagine that more farmers will be doing out, um, outside production um, in terms of meaning the facilities for greenhouse production. It's much more intensive. And um, so we want to make sure we're talking about field stuff, but I want to make sure also that we mention indoor. So indoor, it's going to be uh, the same in terms of fertility and water. Um, but, and, and, and field prep, you might not have, you, you can also actually run cover crops in, in greenhouses as well as um, bet, uh, black plastic bedding, et cetera. Um, but you can also then have the option to trellis your plants. Um, outside production, they, they, some producers will stake their plants. Um, it's just another, it's just another step in terms of labor. Um, but you can trellis your plants indoors versus either with netting or drop down um, the way one would trellis any kind of squash or cucumber. Um, but it's important, very important for airflow. When you're outside, you kind of, you know, you have airflow. Indoors, um, the airflow is important to reduce mold. Um, and so uh, you, it's re recommended to reduce uh, the bottom branches um, at a minimum of 10 inches up that stem. Um, and then additional pruning can be done to either increase airflow, um, again, to reduce fungal infections that I mentioned in mold, um, but also depending on the pruning can also promote more flowering um, and branches. And when you're producing for CBD production, you want the flowering and the branches. So that can potentially increase your yields. Um, okay, really quickly, we're gonna go through just kind of, this is a little bit in season, and talk a little bit about water management and pest management, um, and then hopefully have some time for questions. So um, there are different numbers, again, for water management. It's a little hard to differentiate what um, some of the research are talking about. So they'll say 12 to 15 inches for hemp and 25 to 30 inches um, for growing season for marijuana. So I would imagine that the 12 to 15 inches is for hemp produced for grain and fiber, which is what Brian was talking about, and that 25 to 30 inches is for marijuana. But when we're growing CBD, when we're going hemp for CBD production, we're growing it in a similar system uh, to marijuana. And so you're gonna want a little bit more water. Um, the, if you have ways of irrigating um, that you want to use, um, that is 
recommended, uh, whether that's strip tape, if you have a linear center pivot, um, or even a traveling gun uh, sprayer. Um, however, um, with the rainfall that we have been having in Wisconsin, um, it probably won't be necessary. Um, the hemp likes it drier than wetter, um, has been my experience, and so if you lay drip tape and use it once, it will kind of feel like a little bit of a waste of labor and cost. So um, that's just something to take into consideration. Then looking at nutrient management, we talked about uh, pre-plant applications, um, but then again, adding that, um, that in-season and pre-flowering. Um, a grower in Kentucky where a lot of hemp is being grown, also for CBD, they used um, 125 to 200 pounds, so that's a little bit higher um, and then uh, in terms of rates, uh, and they did a pre-plant, and then again, that over-the-top application right around flowering. Um, research has shown that, it, uh, that um, from a biomass um, yield, will, will go, you know, will increase by almost 3,000 kilograms per hectare from zero to 200 kilograms of N. So basically, the more N you put on there, the higher biomass they were getting. Um, for, so I'm not going to talk much about phosphorus. Um, it's pretty low requirements as, as Brian was mentioning, and it's usually pretty decent in the soil. Or if you're putting in a fertilizer, putting down a fertilizer, it's going to give you enough phosphorus. Um, but but potassium is important, um, and it's going to want that medium to high level range. Um, and that's because, as Brian mentioned again, but we're assuming everyone's new to this, um, that the potassium is is um, mostly in the vegetation and the stalk. And so if we're, if we're growing a crop for biomass and its vegetation, we want to make sure that we're having a good amount of potassium for that plant to take up. Um, and it's also raised um, needs at the start of flowering, similar to nitrogen. And so these are just two pictures on the bottom here. On the left-hand side is um, intermediate deficiency, and then on that right-hand side is um, severe deficiency of potassium. So that's kind of things to look at on your leaf structure to make sure it's, your plant has got enough your plants have enough potassium. Um, and here's a quick, I hope I'm not getting too researchy, but what, what this shows you is why the uh, nutrients are important. And so on the top, we're looking at potassium, and at the bottom, we're looking at nitrogen. And this is just showing over the growing season where, when those plants are taking up those nutrients um, and what part is. So um, this, the red is the stem. And so on the top, you can see that most of the potassium is going into the stem and that's why it's important. And then um, the green is the leaf, uh, and so that's partly potassium, but then on the nitrogen, you can see um, that, you know, the majority of that nitrogen is going to vegetation, thus making both of those nutrients important. Uh, and this is, so this was looking at kind of um, when we're harvesting hemp for grain production, but they also said how much the total plant is taking. So this is gonna be more similar to what, if we're harvesting for CBD when we're taking the whole plant, how much of the nutrient that uh, those plants are extracting from the soil. So I've just highlighted in red, um, it's comparing it to canola. This is out of Canada um, and where hemp is grown comparably to canola. And so you can see that it's removing quite a bit of nutrients from those soils. So um, hence why you need to add uh, to provide enough nutrients for the plant, but then also that it is a heavy nutrient feeder. And so um, in terms of planning, what's coming after this hemp is uh, important. Uh, really quickly, uh, pest management. So weed management, as Brian mentioned, is incredibly important. It's also incredibly important in CBD production. Um, again, there are no labeled um, synthetic pesticides or herbicides for hemp production. Um, that's very important. If you use them, they will be off-label and that is technically illegal. Um, additionally, if we're growing for CBD, the idea that, that the, the end product is going to be extracted and condensed, and so any uh, residue from pesticide is actually being con um, condensed and strengthened and can actually be very dangerous. Um, so ways to prevent weeds, um, black plastic um, or other covers. Um, whether that's um, rye or clover or something else that you have rolled a crimp or mowing on a regular basis. Um, again, often if you're lar a large enough spacing, you can mow. If it's not a large enough spacing, um, you can use row cultivation um, up to a certain point because then those plants will get too big, you can't get the tractor over them. But hopefully once they've gotten that big, they will 
provide enough shade to really reduce um, reduce weed competition. Um, or you can use hose uh, by hand. Um, so I'm so I've had a lot of experience with that. I'm sure most farmers have had a lot of experience with that. So um, I would recommend though. I mean, you see the spacing. If you've got plants at a six by six uh, feet spacing, that's going to be a lot of hand hoeing that seems avoidable. Um, so these are a couple pictures to show you that. So you can see that that top left has black plastic, but because the spacing is so wide, there's a lot of still open soil that has, in terms of nutrient leaching, as well as a potential for, um, for weeds. Uh, you can see on the bottom right that they've gone through and cultivated that a bit more and, and there aren't any weeds. But again, there's no cover there. So um, that's either by hand or they have equipment that can, that can do that. Um, and then this is kind of maybe what, what I would suggest is you have that black plastic, but then in between row, you've got a cover that you can mow. Um, at, or, and on this bottom right, it looks like that's a mulch or a straw, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, is not ideal for Wisconsin and drier climates in Colorado, it works okay. Um, but again, something that's covering that soil. And then as you can see, those plants have gotten quite big and are gonna compete well with potential new weeds. Uh, then talking about insects. So, um, and, and we, we'll talk more about this in uh, later webinars, um, but your, your hemp producer CBD is gonna kind of attract the gamut um, of insects that, that other crops do, whether that's aphids, there is specifically a cannabis aphid, um, or other mites and thrips, and those are, um, those are probably gonna be the larger issue um, for CBD production. Uh, other other insects that are going to defoliate or eat on the leaves exist as well. You know, um, caterpillars, beetles, grasshoppers, and there's different different species um, for sure. Um, and then stalk borers, European corn borer, and then um, in Colorado they they've, they've um, seen prevalence of Eurasian corn borer. Um, and so those are be those can be pretty detrimental because those plants are so heavy. You need a strong stalk to hold them up. And thank you. And also the corn earworm. Um, and that's what's on the right. The left hand picture is um, a cannabis aphid. So I would really highly recommend. So um, I am not an entomologist, um, but Whitney Crenshaw at uh, CSU, Colorado State, has a whole website. Um, and what I live here, and it has all of the possible insects you can imagine, how to prevent them. Um, and then Jay and Parkland has books on cannabis pests. So, um, various ways to get rid of insects. Um, as I said, there's no synthetic pesticides. There are bio pesticides, and that's probably um, what we talked about lists that are on the on, on the ACAP website. That's what these are referring to. Um, and you can also monitor by hand or sticky traps within your fields, prune infested plants, or remove uh, remove. Um, insects by hand. Again, these are all somewhat labor intensive, um, but if it's a really high high profit crop and you think there's going to be, it might maybe worth it. Um, as well as then some be beneficial bugs that are going to um, eat the non-beneficial bugs. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk about disease quickly. Brian also mentioned that molds are going to be the, are, are really detrimental, and and, and particularly in hemp being produced for CBD, that's going to be the case. Um, because you want these heavy, dense flowering buds. As we've all mentioned, a much more humid climate than the West, and so this is so. So this might be the biggest challenge um, in terms of in terms of pest management, um, not insects. So pottery mildew, as well as green mold, um, and then botrytis, which is kind of the bud rot. So it's and it's from the if that's what gray mold. That's the precursor. Or, the bacteria that, excuse me, the fungal pathogen that causes gray mold, um, and it kind of roots the, it rots the flower from the inside out. Uh, so um, it may be hard to see at first, and you will actually, once you've seen it, you've caught it, it's too late. Um, so just really monitoring your field and looking at flowers throughout the growing season, um, the same way you would do for pulling nails. Um, and then the pottery mildew, is it more on the leaves? Um, it's going to look like leaf spots um, that will kind of travel throughout. So this is looking at botrytis on the bottom there. You can see that that bud is being pulled back and it's actually started on the inside and it's moving out. And then on the top is um, some of those pottery mildew spots on the leaves that kind of 
So you can prune those to get rid of before that spread across the plant. Um, and then finally, um, vertebrates, and we can talk more about this later, but you know, deer really like hemp, so fences or other barriers if possible, um, and traps for other mice, moles, and rabbits. Um, and with that, we'll move on. We don't have a lot of time. We just have 10 minutes now. Um, but again, right after Rodrigo's presentation, we'll have an, um, 45 minutes for general question and answer. So we will take any questions, and particularly this is when Forrest will be uh, will play a big part. So hopefully we'll be able to answer them where they are. Uh, besides strain selection and regular testing, what are other ways to prevent the plants from going hot? Any nutrients or cultural practices to apply at certain times? Yeah, so in general, um, you know, all these, all the different genetics have the potential to go hot. So um, you don't want to overfeed the plants, uh, especially, you know, phosphorus and, and potassium later on in the plant's growth stage. Um, you know, we talked about the nutrient needs of these plants, um, which can be high, but you have to keep, keep in mind that the more you feed them, the more cannabinoids they're going to produce. So there's really a, a happy medium there, and I would err on the side of caution. Um, we're not planning on feeding our, our plants, you know, very little to none, because we want to be cautious with approaching those TH3, THC thresholds. Uh, did any hemp growers last year have problems with theft or security breaches? If so, what were the contacts? Any good ideas for security measures? I don't know about Wisconsin in Indiana we had some theft um, and we put up sign they were caught uh, but that doesn't affect your your plants um, signs that say that they're being monitored or or again this goes back to just in general but contacting your local authorities so that they know that you're growing and can kind of be monitoring the area more closely yeah yeah other thing you know I think it was kind of in limited cases in Wisconsin, and I know some cases in Colorado, but uh, you could also do a, a, you know, a cover crop of sunflowers to kind of obscure your crop, or be smart about where you're planting it. Um, pick your location well. Um, put signage up, you know, maybe a little synopsis that says this is, this is industrial hemp, it's not gonna get you high, and I think that'll deter people from, from stealing your crop. Um, so there's lots of things you can do, in my opinion, it's not a huge concern, especially if you're planting acreage. I mean, how much of your crop can somebody get away with in the back of their Subaru? Um, <laughs> but it, it can be significant if, if you, or, or pickup truck or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I'm using this. Um, it, it can be significant, but, but really don't be smart about it. Um, <laughs> I don't see it being a huge issue. We're taping this in Madison, so a lot of Subarus. <laughs> <laughs> on that last slide, I don't know which slide he's referring to. This was at 1123. On the last slide, do you have any correlation to dry matter and CBD content by planting date? I'm not sure who that he's, was. I think he's referring to uh, the planting dates and flower production for, okay. and yeah. um, I don't know. Okay. So, I think I, maybe what he's getting at is, um, you know, these are photo period, I'll try to make this quick, these are photo period plants, so they are going to start maturing based on the length of day. Uh, whether you plant the plant in, you know, the middle of July, uh, in general, they're going to start flowering mid to late August, and they're going to take, you know, 60 days to reach full maturity. So if you plant the plant June 1, it's gonna have a lot, of, a lot longer vegetative phase and get a lot bigger, and then therefore, the middle of August, end of August, when it starts flowering, it's gonna be able to produce a lot more. That same strain, you can plant the middle of July, and then it'll, it'll start flowering you know, at the same time, but it's gonna be a little bitty plant, and you won't get as much yield off of it. I don't know if that answered that question or not. But. It was, it was a good effort. Okay. Uh, planting in clover, planting in clover in spring, when to plant the clover, what type, how soon after do you transplant the seedlings? Do you clear the area for the transplants? Do you mow the clover? So I would 
I don't have exact dates on that. I would recommend, and of course, you might have some more. I recommend getting the clover established um, before you transplant. Otherwise, it's not going to create any kind of weed protection for you. Um, red clover is kind of, I think, what's been used generally. Um, and that, um, so yes, you would clear the field, plant your clover, get it established, and then transplant into it, and you can mow the clover throughout the season. I would agree with that, yeah. A, you know, or a white clover. You plant, let it get established, yeah. um, and then plant either your, your little starts, your little clones, or, or your seeds, or your seedlings. Is anyone using organic fertilizers like worm casting, either while planting the seed or when transplanting? Yes. Great. That's nice. Yes. Um, please provide words of caution for tight spacing used in drier climates. That is very risky here. Mold is much more likely to form in tight spacing than from straw mulch. Yes. Yes. Ab absolutely. Right. Can I elaborate on that really sure. quick? So, I as as far as a CBD grower, I would not be concerned with with yield of of you know biomass of sellable product. I would I would be concerned with uh, you know pests and mold and and the THC threshold. These are just kind of cautionary tales. So speaking to that point, I would absolutely um, you know err on the side of caution with your row spacing and your plant spacing, as opposed to keeping things too close together and, and running into potential problems with mold or other pests. What is the cost of unfeminized seed compared to feminized? Feminized seed is is considerably more expensive. Uh, there's really not a standard, so I'd, I'd hesitate to, to name an actual price on both, but uh, feminized seed's quite a bit more expensive. But maybe twice as much? Uh, approximately twice as much. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more than twice as much. Yeah. So if you get regular seeds and you gotta, you gotta call out 50% of your males, it, it, it uh, ends up being more or less a horse apiece. <laughs> Is there a good specific disposal recommendations for pruning and or trimming? Um, that's a good question. I think generally burning is, is thought to, is generally disposal. Sure, yeah. Okay. What is better, white plastic or black plastic? So, I don't know. I might have more thoughts on that. One of the things with that can boost THC is heat. Yeah. Um, and so uh, black plastic is going to be a lot hotter, um, so potentially white plastic would be something to think about. Yeah, I'd recommend white plastic. My land currently does not have a well for water source. Should I put one in for watering purposes? I don't think that it would be useful. I don't, I don't think it's necessary. And I just speak to the plastic a little bit. You know, you need to be really careful. These, these plants do need, you know, relatively regular waterings, but you have to be really careful with holding too much water in the soil. You know, we, we talked about botrytis, you know, and, and other uh, pests and, and diseases related to the humidity levels and the water levels here. Um, keeping the roots too wet too long is, is just, it's the worst thing you can do for these, for these cannabis plants. Uh, they will drown if they don't get good oxygen to the roots. So be very careful with putting plastic and overwatering these plants. Okay, um, I've had a, co a clover crop planted in my one acre fields for five years. What's the best way to prepare for planting? Mowing, tilling, no-till, or other? Depends on, it, it, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on your, you know, your capabilities, your equipment. Uh, a no-till situation, in my opinion, would be fine, especially with that clover being established like it has been. So okay. I think that's your best option for not promoting, you know, future weed growth and competition with your plant. I think you got a good, a good cover crop there. I wouldn't disturb it too much. Okay. Um, oh, I'm finding earlier questions I missed here. Uh, sorry. With what is the smaller is better for cell size based on? I've seen 50 cell, 98 cell, even 3.5 pots do super well. It has to do with conditions when you transplant and how well you harden off. Yes, um, I think that's true, how well you harden off and condition of transplanting for sure. The idea being that if you're taking a big plant and switching how it's been living, it, it has a harder time 
revving back up to, to where it needs to be and, and acclimating to what you've just done to it. For it's a smaller plants that generally are able to acclimate faster and better. Deep cells on the trays, how deep? Four inches? Foot, foot, four inches? Are they asking about how deep to plant the cells, maybe? I read it as is, so I'm not sure. So, deep cells deep cells on the tray, question mark, how deep? Four inches, question mark. Well, typically these, these trays are more or less a standard depth. There's a little deviation, but I think maybe the question's uh, asking about how deep to plant the, the rooted seedling or clone. <coughs> They need to be they need to be well seated in the ground, and um, other than that, you just want to cover you want to cover that existing root that existing root ball with a little bit of medium and make sure they're seated in there firmly. I also did put deep cell next to that, which might be the confusion. Which um, is, I know that um, so 144 is and I they aren't they're a regular kind of same same depth, but um, things like. Um, in in the in the horticulture you see things where the Christmas trees that have these like deep cells oh, they allow for that taproot those sounds, are usable. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more and then we'll switch to Rodrigo. Hardening the seedings seedlings. I heard in the direct sunlight for eight hours. Why the shade confused? Okay, so if you're getting your seedlings or your clones uh, from an indoor facility, there's gonna be a pretty a pretty serious and a pretty extensive hardening process you need to be really careful with. You do not want to take those plants from an indoor situation and put them right outside in direct sunlight. Um, they will show up and die. So uh, it depends on where the plants have come from and it depends on you know a, a lot of different factors. You know, To what extent have they already been hardened? Were they grown in a greenhouse under shade cloth or a greenhouse you know with direct sun? So Really, from whatever situation they were in, you want to uh, go slow and and slowly introduce these plants to the natural elements. That being wind and and sun, uh, mainly, you know, and then temperature swings. If they're in a greenhouse or an indoor situation, uh, they're going to have a more constant temperature between day and night. So you need to slowly acclimate them to that as well. So it's all relative to where the plants come from. Uh, but you do not want to take plants and just put them directly outside. That's why they put them under the shade cloth first to slowly acclimate them to the intensity of the sun. Okay, with that, I think we'll switch over to Rodrigo. 